we're here today for a session with Michael Lowy, and I'd like to begin, as is customary in Berkeley, with words of thanks. The first go to John Moffat, research librarian at the Needham Research Institute, and Jeremy Tanner, art historian co comparing Rome and Han, who are in Cambridge, England, assisting Michael Lowy during this event. On the Berkeley side, Mark Csikszentmihalyi of East Asian Languages and Cultures joins me in co-hosting. And behind the Zoom scenes, uh, we have Xiaojie Ma and Sophie Volpe to thanks for today's session. My job today is very simple. I am here to introduce Michael Lowy, who plainly needs no introduction and to alert all viewers to the fact, if they don't know it, that Michael is the recent recipient in November of last year of the Chinese Social Sciences Academy's most prestigious award, along with Joseph Efferich, Berkeley's own, and a highly distinguished professor of Chinese poetry at Nankai University. The official announcement had this to say, the award aims to promote the development of Chinese studies and scholars exchanges around the world. A group of 87 experts voted on this award. The three scholars have spent a lifetime studying China and enjoy high prestige in their disciplines worldwide. This is still the award announcement. Their studies have greatly contributed to the world's understanding of China. Speaking of Michael Lowy, the award announcement notes, the 99 year old made his first visit to China in 1947. His academic journey began with the study of the Han Dynasty documents written on bamboo slips, mainly in Juyan, and he later became one of the world's greatest scholars on this subject. My own thoughts um, were, would there be an early China field without Michael Lowy? Quite possibly not. In 2019, the Academia Sinica in Taiwan published in their journal a list of publications by Michael Lowy attesting his cross straits eminence. That list included no fewer than 14 books and four pages single spaced of essays in journals or as book chapters. I would like many to note that Michael has published since 2019 four major essays, one in a book devoted to the technical arts in the Han histories published by Sunni Press, and three in the very fine Journal of Asian History published in Europe. I myself can attest to Michael's ongoing interest in several questions in Han history, especially Wangmang and Luoyang, the city of late, um, as we talk frequently about such topics. As some of you know already, Michael Lowy will be honored, given a, the signal honor of a feshrift in the forthcoming Early China volume. And that's in, now in final preparation. And to this feshrift, many scholars in Euro-America and the PRC are contributors. For that, we owe thanks to Sarah Allen, who now resides in Berkeley, but still uses her Dartmouth email. Trenton Wilson, a Berkeley PhD, now on a Yale postdoctoral fellowship and soon to go to Princeton, co-wrote the editor's introduction with me as Wilson was fortunate enough to study with Michael Lowy in Berkeley. To start the ball rolling, I thought I would ask an old friend of Michael's, Virginia Bauer from Princeton, um, uh, to give her question. And also, um, which I will read out for her. And um, we have a question from Hong Kong, from a pre-doctoral candidate in Berkeley, which Mark will um, read out. 
After that, the session will be open. That pre-doctoral candidate comes from Hong Kong. So we thought again, Sino-American relations is what we're doing here. Um, Virginia Bauer's question, and it's not an easy one, um, Michael, um, uh -huh. would be, how would you look at Dowager Empress Lu in hindsight? Um, and she's interested because of her own Tang studies background, wondering if Wu Zetian might have been thinking of how successful Dowager Empress Lu was um, uh, looking when Wu Zetian was looking backwards. You start by praising me many, many thanks for all that you have said. And I do deeply appreciate all the compliments you have given me. Now for the question, of course, not an easy one to answer because we know so little about the Empress. Um, dare I say I don't. No. Mm. What? Uh, repeat the question, please. Um, the main part of the question is how would you assess Dowager Empress Lu? <laughs> Lu, I should pronounce it carefully. <laughs> um, and um, um, what would be your thoughts if you've had any recently? I haven't had any thoughts recently. <clears throat> And I've never actually had a long study of the Empress. Um, is there enough really to answer the question runs through my mind. Mm -hmm. We have the account, which of course, <coughs> which of course is fixed against her. And um, we desperately need somebody who'd say, what good things she may have done. Mm -hmm. Look, you give me a question I can't answer. <laughs> That's okay. There will be some of those questions here. And we wanted to put Virginia first just because of your longtime friendship. So, Thank you. Um, Mark, you have Mark Shalfais. Uh, yeah, so um, by email, we got a question from Ma Xiaofei from Hong Kong, and it, it's that it's about Eastern Han, Eastern Han popular culture uh, in, in the Eastern Han popular culture gets a lot more attention from figures like Wang Chong and Ying Shao. And the, the gist of the question is, does that mean that there is a different knowledge structure during the Eastern Han relative to the Western Han. What accounts for this interest in popular culture? I think probably you're right that there was much greater standard degree of knowledge in Eastern Han than Western Han. One can only think of the great increase there was in teaching, in the establishment of schools, one can also think in a political way, maybe I'm being controversial here, I'm thinking that working politically in Eastern Han must have got more and more demanding and dangerous perhaps, with the result that you get people retiring and taking, such as Wang Chung, and taking to writing. I don't know if this answers the question. You know, it's, it's... I would add, if I may, Michael. Come on. Um, I won't usually have things to add, but here I think I do. If we think of Bielenstein's maps of AD2 and AD140, we see uh, so many more registered households in the South. Um, and so we're beginning to get uh, eminent families um, that are based in the South, um, which is also implied. And sometimes they're officials and sometimes they're not. Yeah. If I agree with you absolutely. Certainly one can see a move from North to South during Eastern Han. 
move into the north by non-Han tribes and leaders, what do you and I do if we've been keeping a farm there? My God, we get out of their way as quickly as we can. We come down south, which is why eventually you get an increase of population in the commanderies south of the Yellow River. Mm. No, I think you're right. Yeah, and those, some of those um, migrants must have been really struck with how different customs were um, in various places. Yeah. Oh, suppose one had been a farmer in the north, doing one's work, yes, subject to changes of weather, subject to all the different things that happen to a farmer. Right, suddenly there's an inrush of refugees from the west, They've been driven out of their homes by non-Chinese peoples, driven out by people on horseback. Right, what to do? What do you and I do? We take people in, do we? Of course we do, out of charity. And after a short time, one's wife will say, look, we can't go on keeping these people forever. And so down they are sent to the south, seeking a living. And you see this eventually in the increase in population of the provinces south of the river. Thank you. I was thinking about World War II and your family history there. Uh -huh. um, but we'll move on to the next questions, Mark. Sure. Tell me, by the way, if I'm answering too long. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, I was thinking about the Eastern Han emphasis on kind of Jiao Hua, on this kind of transformation through education, and was wondering if part of the, the remit of being an official has more to do with kind of controlling popular culture. And I'm thinking of Ying Shao in particular, who, you know, as governor would, would actually ban certain practices. Is, is that part of the, the, the interest is that you're cataloging it in order to dis decide what, what needs to be controlled and what doesn't? Or is that, am I being too cynical? I, I don't suppose you are being too cynical. You're asking questions which have occurred to me in rather different forms in various ways. That, I mean, what does seem to me after recent thought is that the degree of intellectual understanding is so much higher in Eastern Han than Western Han and therefore produces with it any number of questions and there are people who set about trying to answer them. But I know I'm not answering your question properly. No, no, that's great. Mark, I would simply say that um, having worked on Feng Su Tomi, that of course by popular culture there, we include many elites um, who are local. Um, and, and those are really um, his main target. Um, who are the models, um, uh, he, he names names, um, and, and they're all quite prominent elites. One question, please. Do we all agree that whatever the story of political history in Eastern Han is, what we do note is a major important increase in the degree of intellectual understanding and activity? Um, if you mean by numbers of people, by an increase, I, I absolutely agree with you that we appear to be seeing many more people who are literate and engaged in these kinds of activities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. His question is, how do you situate Wang Mang in the history of classical learning? And he's also interested in how has your view about Wang Meng changed over the years? He's asking questions about somebody whom I've been longing to understand properly. 
I wouldn't say that my view has changed over the years. I would say that I've continually been putting off trying to establish a view which I can uphold. Um, and I find it exceedingly difficult. All right, we've got somebody, all the writings about him are by his opponents, which doesn't help in the slightest. We do read of his reintroduction of certain old practices, old ideas which had got out of date. I just feel I wish I could read something from the other side. And you're talking about one man, and for God knows how many years I've put off trying to study him. Um, I ought not to have done so, I know that. But uh, you can see I, I can't answer your question. Um, let's see, I think um, Nick might be here. I'm not sure if uh, they're able to bring him up for a follow-up, but... Um... Oh, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yes. How about a follow-up, Nick? Well, I guess what I'm thinking is, so there's a, a few ways that I've been thinking about whether even in Bangu's view, we think what Wang Mang is doing with the classics is characteristic of how the classics has been treated up to that point, or if Wang Mang is doing something very different. And if he's doing something different, does this explain perhaps some of the changes we see um, going into the Eastern Han? You're asking a question which I hesitate to answer. I don't know enough about Wang Mang. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, I simply have to leave it like that, I'm afraid. I, yeah. uh, I, I think that's how we felt as well when we were reading him as well, is that yeah. there's too many, there's still no, uh, too many gaps. Well, of course, the difficulty about Wang Man, um, one would like to know so much more about him. One is conscious the whole time that what one reads is written by his enemies. Yes. And um, where are we? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, someone writing in from Vietnam who wants to ask you about the relationship between the Han and Nan Yue. Um, and what, how would you characterize the, the, the relationship between those two, two areas during the Han period? Well, you've got the advance in Western Han times and the establishment of Jun commanderies there. And I've never thought that the ideal of Han rulership was established very firmly. And we find, I'm talking from memory, but I think we find that quite early in Eastern Han, those four commanderies are reduced. I don't recall, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I don't recall anybody from those deep down commanderies taking part in Han history. Maybe some of you do, and I'd be very glad to be corrected. Um, I once had to do some, something about that part of the world in modern times, and I hated doing it because I simply couldn't understand it. But what did leave me, the impression that I was left with, was uh, that the Han takeover of those deep south commanderies was not particularly effective and didn't really count a great deal in Han history. Now, this was the impression of some years ago. Whether on rereading the material I'd change it, I simply don't know. 
Um, I'll say here that Andrew Hardy and I found an astonishing increase of classical masters reported for Eastern Han from Kwai Ji. We're still working on that. Um, and um, Qi and Lu go right out of existence. I mean, very few from Qi and Lu. Um, um, although those from Donghai continue. So it's a very complicated picture and we hope to map it. The next one I have on my list is from um, one of the 30 undergraduates who, who read your um, historical fiction, uh, the, the, the Bing story. Uh -huh. uh, and, and Alyssa Fu asks, what creative works inspired you to write Bing's story? Were there fictional works that you had in mind that helped you design the trajectory? You're attributing wonderful <laughs> motives to me. <laughs> One day I was feeling rather weary and decided to take a few days holiday in a nice hotel which I knew in Holland. So over I went and after a day or so, I went to a shop and I said, I need some paper please to write on. And I started writing the draft of that book while I was on holiday. But uh, more than that, I can't really remember. Um, I wrote most of it there when I was, oh, it was in, in Holland, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. So the next uh, question we have, um, uh, maybe I'll ask Hu Xu's question. He asks, if many Prechin texts were compiled during the Han, as we... If, if, if many... If many Prechin texts uh -huh. were, were actually compiled during the Han as... as and what he means is a reef reformulated under Leo Shang. Okay. Oh, yeah. Understood. How, how does that change our understanding of the transition between kind of the pre-Chin period and the Chin Han period? Does it lead us to question some of our older assumptions? You ask difficult questions, don't you? Well, that, that's Hu Xu. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Now, this is a, a graduate student in the history department here. I have to leave the question to him. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Uh, wouldn't you say, Michael, that the problem with the question is it must be case by case? Um, so that if we're looking at uh, a, a text, we must ascertain which passages possibly, and it will be a guess, which passages possibly look later. Well, um, you're absolutely right, of course. Don't tell. You must, of course, look at texts in that way. I'm trying to think of an example which would suit, but sorry, I can't, I can't. No, you're quite right. Um, I was thinking of I think Zhang Guo Tsi, I, I'm often confusing it with Guoyu, I put them in the same mental box, but I think Zhang Guo Tsi was originally taken from many different writings that, yeah, yeah. Um, and so there you would look for counterpart texts to see, does this seem plausible, I think, something like that. Well done, well done. <laughs> I am your student, <laughs> so. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I'm yours. So the next question comes from Wen Ro Xuan, who is writing from McGill. And I'm going to read this question because I'm, I might, I'm not quite sure I understand it, but I think that, that you probably will. So during the Han Dynasty, many emperors issued edicts giving every person a rank. Does that mean you, sorry, giving every person rank? A, a kind of uh, I guess it probably this is, means jie, orders like, of orders honor. of merit, right? Uh, no, no, yeah, I do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And does that mean that in time everyone will have a rank or is were those actually in practice given to those who already had a rank? Um, let me explain that um, most of us use rank in, uh, to indicate many, many things, including what is your official rank? Are you an officer or, and yep. that is separate from orders of honor. So I say that to the audience, but I believe the question has to be about orders of honor. Thanks. You have. Right. I would call them orders of honor, yes. Now, <clears throat> of course, they're recorded in the histories as gifts of the emperor. And one immediately asks, what did that gift involve in the way of duties? And I think one can see there I say clearly, there I say vaguely, I think one can see that with an increase in the rank, the grade that you are given, duties follow, and perhaps certain gifts follow, up to number 18. Um, thereafter, the series goes into the nobilities and it's a rather different story um i wrote about those grades those ranks years years ago i think what's very noticeable is and i'm speaking from memory here i'm pretty sure that in eastern han there came a time when the gift of those orders of honor stopped Michael, um, as your editor for yeah. that, um, you did say that in, in AD 147. Thank you, thank you. Well, and of course that does fit in very happily with what else was going on in Bohan history over the way in which land was being occupied and taxed. I haven't answered your question, I know. Well, um, when they stop giving these orders, then we should realize that the life-giving face of the empire is no longer available, which implies um, there's nothing to get people in the localities to particularly buy into um the empire and the dynasty i think that's implied um by this and um is a very important um this is hypothetical but um would be a very important factor um in how the dynasty may have fallen well i tell you what has occurred to me over the recent weeks when as you know i not able to check things in a book. It has seemed to me that from, let us say, 150 onwards, there's been such a major advance into south of the Yellow River. You've got various peoples closing in in the north, northeast, and indeed the northwest. They're not Han peoples. Uh, they ride horses, they're out to pillage and to seize what they can. Eventually you get a movement of civil population from the north down to the south. If you or I hold a farm in the north and suddenly, overnight, half a dozen people turn up saying, oh, for God's sake, give us shelter. You say yes, and after 10 days or so, you say, well, how the hell are we going to feed these people? Eventually down they go to the south and you get the great increase of population in the south as compared with previously. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Mm. Yes, very much. 
And uh, Renoir Shren says, thank you very much for that. So, uh -huh. good. So the, the next one, we have a couple questions about the distinction you draw between modernists and reformists in the uh -huh. Um, the first one uh, comes from Hans van Es, another uh, uh, scholar who we read multiple pieces from in the Han Thought Course. Um, he says that he has a question about the modernist reformist dichotomy that you brought up in Crisis and Conflict uh, uh -huh. and, and some articles previous to that book. Um, Professor Van Ness says, I've used these terms and found them extremely useful, but I know some have criticized them. But what I'm interested in is how did you come to invent this terminology to talk about Han political debates in the first place? And do you have any reflections on it 50 years later? How did I invent the terminology? <laughs> if you're asking a question, I might have answered 50 years ago, I suppose I must have thought of the principles on which the two parties seem to be based. And I was looking for something which I hoped would, I dare not say describe the difference, but would point to the difference in a useful manner. If I had to choose terms today, I don't know what I would choose. It's an interesting thought for me to think about. Michael, you yeah. and I have talked about the number of people who, despite your very clear language um, in crisis and conflict, and even your most recent publications, have simply assumed that the reformists were Ru and the um, Confucians, um, and that the legalists um, uh, were the modernists. And um, I think you were very careful, were you not, to say all of these people are Ru. They are all classically trained. <laughs> Um, and so um, it's important to distinguish different strains and debates among the classicists. Thank you. Um, you made clear what I have had in mind too, which is the, that the use of the term Confucianist is extremely dangerous. And in many cases may fail completely to represent the truth of what people were thinking and trying to do. Um, for example, people would say that so many of the officials of Western Han were, are described as a rule. Therefore, they must have been followers of Confucius. That is the great question, which I'm quite doubting and have doubted for some time. Yes, they'll quote him. Yes, people quoted the Old Testament in the 19th century, in the 1880s. You ask, what did they believe? So do I. Yes, um, I've been working with students on the Hanshu and all the presumptions about the so-called Confucianization of the laws. Yeah. And we simply don't see the evidence for it. Um, we're working as hard as we can. Um, but I would direct uh, those in the audience to Michael's most recent publications in Journal of Asian History. Um, that include his thoughts on the role of Kongze um, in Han times. And there will be in his Feshrift a very interesting essay by Tim Barrett on um, Tim's um, um, evidence-based, but necessarily still speculative uh, thoughts um, on when um, Confucius becomes singularly great as a master. Um, and that's in the post Han period. Thanks. Uh, 
All right, I think. I'm not a Christian. But all right, we were brought up. Victorian England was marked by a devotion to Christianity in various different forms. All right, one looks at the history of the times and I have wondered. Let me leave it like that. So one other question about modernist versus reformist comes from an undergraduate named Brian Ho, Ho who asks, did people in the Han see themselves as being in differing political camps? I, I noticed you used the word parties earlier. How self-conscious was, you know, people we identify as reformist, how, how self-conscious were they that there were kind of two main groups? It's a very interesting question, and I don't think there's a clear answer. Um, I can well imagine that in some cases, somebody who might be described as reformist has been bitterly unhappy at the introduction of certain forms, certain laws perhaps, by the other lot. What they do about it, of course, is a difficult question to answer. Look, let me go slightly adrift of this and think of Sima Qian, wrote his history, was sent above, hidden from public view. He was castrated. There's just a little sentence at the end, I think, of the biography, which points this out and describes his visit to a shrine dedicated to Confucius, which I think shows Samatian's utter disgust with some of the thoughts which pervaded public life in his own time, public uh, and which of course had led to his punishment and castration. Just to clarify for the audience members, um, because the his was ambiguous, it's at the end of the hereditary house for Kongza, not at the end of Sima Chen's autobiographic chapter. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay, the next question is um, on the question and answer from Sean Cronin. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Sean said, uh, asks, um, following up on the earlier question about the Han and, and Nan Yue, I wonder if you could say something about the place of the Western Han in relation to the Xiongnu Confederacy or the interstate environment more broadly. Do you think it is useful for us to think of an interstate order for the Western Han period? Sean, if we can see you, that would be great. If not, okay. Interstate order puzzles me. I don't quite know what's uh, involved. I think he just means Shonu Han relations, right? Yes. So put the question again, please. Sean, do you want to rephrase the question if you're here? Yes, I'm here. Yes, um, I, 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 I don't see a button to turn on my video, but I can, I can speak. Um, okay, thanks. Yes, um, thank you so much for coming to, to have this conversation with us. Um, I'm thinking in terms of com thinking comparatively with the Song Liao um, interstate order of the 10th and 11th centuries. It, you know, is there something comparable in the Han and the Xiongnu, or are scholars of middle period and late imperial China maybe bringing too much of our own um, uh, structures to understanding the kind of diplomatic histories of the Western Han? You give a chap a difficult question, don't you? <laughs> and, uh, uh, you can see 
you've made me hesitate considerably. Of course, the question which has occurred to me about relations between Han and the Xiongnu is, of course, we've only got one side recorded. Um, there was a time when the Shan Yu came down to Chang'an 33, 35 uh, uh, BCE, if I've got it right, mm -hmm. and they gave great party, welcomed him, etc., etc. And I've asked myself, what the hell was going on? Um, I'm puzzled to know what the relationship was or in what it involved. There was a Xiongnu leader being entertained lavishly by a Han leader. What the hell's a Han leader doing entertaining a barbarian of that sort? And, um, and the answer, I presume, is he's doing it under pressure. And one can go on thinking from there onwards. Do I make it clear that I'm in great doubts and difficulties? Um, if I could interject, one of the things about being trained by you um, oh. is that you were always looking at the archaeology. Um, and that's proven to be enormously helpful in, in Song Yuan uh, relations, less so in Han. Uh, we certainly know that the Xiongnu were immensely rich, and we know that they had um, major cities, um, but um, we are still lacking lots of documentation we would like to have. So the answer may be, we just don't know. Well, I think you're probably right. If for God's sake, if only we had some documentation from the Shunyu side, ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we can say is that a Shunyu prince was made regent um, by Han Wu Di. Um, and I find that hard to believe that that would have happened in Song and Yuan. <laughs> Yeah, yes. <laughs> so. Yes, Rem, Rem, you touched the point that the books we read, Han Shu, should be up to a point, Han Shu, they're from the Chinese point of view. God's sake, if only we had something written by the other side. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I was just reading documents with my undergraduates from Dunhuang um, uh -huh. for the Five Dynasties period. And there we have a rich treasure trove in Paris. That's what we want, <laughs> but yeah. that's not what we have right now. <laughs> so. Yeah, yes. Should I move on to the next question? I have um, a graduate student who asks, uh, this is Jay Hassan, who mm -hmm. asks, if you have advice for students going into Han studies, what do you think are the strengths and shortcomings of the field? And what are your hopes for the future? Sure. You don't ask short questions, do you? <laughs> uh, well, I think still there's quite a lot to be done in interpreting records that we have particularly of Pohan. This is the one that worries me so much. We've got histories written after Hohan times. And I think a comparison of statements there might prove valuable. Um, there's statistical work that can be done, I think in size of commanderies, size of population in commanderies, that sort of thing. One can ask questions which can, perhaps cannot be answered. How far was Han rule applicable in a certain area? We touched it just now in that question about Renan in earlier times. 
you can see that I'm in difficulties. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Michael, um, maybe this is a point for you to talk about your project comparing Han and Rome. Oh, my goodness. Well, yes. I know you've tabled it for the moment, but um, many of us are interested in that project. Well, what have you got? Two major empires with their own forms of rule, their own ideas and ideals. You have Rome extending its rule into Africa, into Britain, but not necessarily imposing its own constitutional forms there. What have you got in China? Extension, extension of one of the same type of rulership further and further afield. With Rome, you have a great insistence, a great attention to the use of armed force and the extension of what I suppose I've got to call Roman territory as a result. In China, you've got the imposition of a single form of government over more and more extensive lands. So you have different types of government arising in each case. One may ask, which is the more effective? And the answer is, with Rome, of course, one can see the effective use of military force. China, of course, it's the civil officials whom one fastens on. Oh dear, you see the sort of way I'm trying to think. What sort of institutions did each party have and how how did Rome get on without the sort of rule run by officials? How did Han China get on without the means of expressing opinions in quite the same way? Look, this is the way I've been trying to think. I've written it up and it's been refused by one publisher on the grounds that I haven't handled Rome sufficiently well. <laughs> it's on my shelf, having taken good account of the criticisms which he, which he gave me. But um, do I show the sort of way I'm thinking two mighty empires, roughly the same sort of time, each imposing its rule on others. In the one case in China, with a set of highly regulated institutions and a different view of the way in which human beings could be chosen to act, could act in an official capacity. Rome, a fine place where an individual can make a name for himself as a fighting soldier, leading troops in battle, or establishing a regime in a place very distant from Rome itself. I've tried to talk about what I've been thinking. There it is. Um. On this note, I know that Carlos Nareña from Berkeley is coming and we're going to be talking about that manuscript. So to be continued. <laughs> well, I would love to talk with him about just this subject. Um, I'm not an expert in Roman history, but uh, no, I, I would love to. Great. So we have a question from Kim Yong-ha 
from Columbia University. And the question is, what, are the pro what were the problems of Chang'an that the Eastern Han Dynasty had to move their capitals to Luoyang? Um, and there's a second question, which is, another question is how to pronounce your surname, because here in Korea, it is often read as something like Roy. Uh, pronunciation in this country and in the United States is Loe. Once I take a plane or a ship to the continent of Europe, so I seek Loewe Yes. It happens automatically. Now the first question, sorry, repeat it, please. What was wrong with Chang'an that the Eastern Han moved the capital to Luoyang? Puzzling question, isn't it? It's, uh, what was wrong with Chang'an? Supply, you know, was more difficult in Chang'an than in Luoyang. But I don't know how important that was. No, you've asked the question. I, I should have asked myself years and years ago. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I'll have to miss it. No, that's great. Um, so uh, the next question comes from Luke Haberstad, uh, uh -huh. uh, who uh, we, we all uh, uh, know and miss here at Berkeley. The title of the talk is in dialogue with the Han histories. So I would be interested in hearing about conducting research using the histories with Han in the title, the Han Shu and the Ho Han Shu, and perhaps the Han Ji. It's a broad question, but aside from the fact that they focus on different time periods, how should we think about these texts comparatively? Han Shu and Ho Han Shu and, and Han Ji mm -hmm. and Ho Han Ji. Well, I think we've got to. Han Shu, of course, was written in Han times, was it not? Writing about pre Han times. The Others which wrote about later Han, some were written, were they not, after the dynasty, which I think makes quite a, di a considerable difference in the thoughts which lay in the minds of the writers. Um, having seen as they had the results of the breakdown of a dynasty. Uh, you can see that it's not an easy question to answer. One's got to think of the loyalties which the authors had to the dynasty they are describing, or the degree of criticism which they feel they can express without any fears. Um, go on, write up the answer to the question. It will take you five years. <laughs> um, I want to ask you an easy question, Michael, um, just to interrupt. Um, <laughs> you're sitting in the Needham Research Institute. Um, and in um, your earlier years, while at Cambridge um, and earlier still in London, um, you knew many luminaries. Um, that would include Joseph Needham, D.C. Lau, A.C. Graham, David Hawkes. Um, I wondered if you would care, because you're such a um you're so mindful of your teachers and peers um if you'd like to comment on any or all of those personalities hey, hey. <clears throat> uh, well you're talking of people whom i worked with whom i admired who taught me a great deal the gods they did they had all been through 
course of training in Han history. I had not. I had to do it in my spare time as a civil servant. I came to admire enormously the way they worked, falsely in the way he looked at a text, spotted its difficulties and described them and tried to provide a solution. Who else did you mention? Uh, D.C. Lau, I mentioned, A.C. Graham oh, and Needham. D.C. Lau and I were close colleagues. I was at School of Oriental Studies as a lecturer for a time. We used to go on holidays together. Now, D.C. Lau had been trained in philosophy in a Scottish university. So you can imagine the breadth with which he would consider the work of the Chinese philosophers. Mm -hmm. And you may well imagine and admire, as I did, the way in which he would be able to quote the sayings of Western philosophers as well as Eastern ones. Graham, did you mention? I did. And I'm I'm thinking um, Graham was, of course, a famous eccentric, but. Uh, <laughs> a famous eccentric. Um, <laughs> well, I remember visiting me. He shared a room with Lao at one time. And throughout that time, they always addressed each other as, can you tell me, Mr. Lao, such and such? And it was formal like that. Graham, I never knew personally in the way that I knew other colleagues. Um, yes, I reviewed his books with a deep admiration for his learning and the way he applied that learning. I had to criticize some of his views his interpretation of the thoughts that were being transmitted. But there we are. He wasn't easy to talk with Graham. Um, but all right, I mean, he'd get right down to the basic questions which attended a citation from the Lunu or whatever text it would be. Who else did you mention? You're sitting in the Needham Research Institute. So. <laughs> you want me to talk about Joseph Needham? I do. Never got the praise from Sinologists that he jolly well deserved. Mm. Right, he had not been through the training that people such as Graham Vandaloon had been, and my God, they despised him for it most unnecessarily. Needle, of course, had seen service in China itself, which they had not seen. Um, and he had a view of China which drew from a knowledge of so many other subjects. Now, you can say, if you like, that Van der Doen was a far deeper scholar than Needham. So he was in working through a text, in working out its difficulties, finding the solution. Oh, he was infinitely better at that than Needham was. Interpreting what the John Dranza was saying and putting that into the context of Chinese thought, contrasting it with what was happening in Greece or Rome, is read Needham. And people would criticize and think that, yes, Needham did this, but he also overdid the scientific approach in the same way as people would say that Van der Loon overdid the scholarly approach. Those two, as far as I know, never exchanged a word. 
which says a great deal, well, on which I'm not going to dwell. Uh, who else did you mention? Sorry, the, David Hawkes, whom you mentioned. A wonderful chap. There he was in Oxford as a professor and um, took it very lightly. And the time came when he decided he was going to retire. He wanted to give up all the business of having to teach undergraduates, wanted to retire to Wales to study Welsh poetry, which he did. And um, he was a very great scholar, Hawkes, and he could get it across to other people so well. Um, I'm thinking of books that he wrote. Sorry, the names of the Hulu Mung. Yes. Story and, uh, of the Stone. Exactly, yes. No, uh, and uh, the two the two poems, of course, mm. which were his first publication, prepared when he was at a very early stage of scholarship. No, um, Hawkes I admired enormously. And um, it was and a did pity. He, mm -hmm. Did he not write the little primer of Dufu, which is a marvelous book? Tell me about it. You know more about it than I do. Well, I'm I'm not sure I'm doing this from memory, and I'm I'm often mistaken, but um um what he did was show first the characters and the transliteration and then i believe he did two or three levels of unpacking of the poem um so you really got a sense of how much is packed into chinese poetry uh -huh. um, by the great poets um, for me it was a revelation trying to learn chinese i'm a prose person but that is one of my favorite books, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew him. I wish I'd known him better than I did. And uh, these things happen. Well, you knew him pretty well because he was at your 80th birthday party. He was. <laughs> You're right. <Yeah. laughs> I sat next to his wife, um, and him i think at the table yeah you sat Mark. next to him i remember <laughs> so i have a couple of local culture questions that have come in um the first is from terry Kleeman, who note is interested in sichuan uh and said sichuan supplied high officers of state and archaeological remains it's an important part of han china but in the fourth century was still only semi sinicized with large and difficult to control non Han groups. So his question is, what of the previous Shu culture survived into the Han, if any? How do we read the past in Sichuan? You've asked the question. <laughs> I can't answer it. Okay. You know, it's a technical one. I, I wouldn't. Uh, well, then I have a more general question from Andrew Hardy, um, who asks, uh, to what extent are local regional studies possible for the Han period? Interesting question. Nothing like as much as they are for later periods, unfortunately. But I think quite a lot could be worked out by looking hard at the biographies of our histories and looking for information about the locality, which may be glossed over, it may just be suggested rather than explained fully, but it would be a good thing. Oh, for heaven's sake, let's have a history of Sichuan uh, with what was going on there in the various activities the lakes and their produce. Um, 
it could be could be done, but with some difficulty. Um, I was thinking about Huayang Guozhi, but also about all these great recent excavated manuscripts and archaeological site reports. Um, uh -huh. Michael and I have been going through um, one or two of these reports, for example, um, over the phone, and I'm going to look forward to working on those with him when I go to visit. Hooray. <laughs> we have a question from Professor Lisa Rafels, who says, thank you so much for your words on Joseph Needham. This question regards younger students entering the field. Given a tension between a straight course of academic study and a life course that intersperses academic study with other kinds of experience, do you have any recommendations for younger scholars? They don't ask easy questions, do they? <laughs> uh, yes. Recommendations for younger scholars. <laughs> First thing I would say is, for God's sake, get your subject into proper perspective and carry on from that. And, answer the question with that in view. Sorry. By proper perspective, do you mean cross-cultural or cross-chronological work? I know perfectly well I've concentrated too much on individual problems, questions of Chinese history. I haven't been able to put them into the context of what else was happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm getting at? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so illuminating sometimes to find out, well, this is peculiar to uh, Zhangguo or to the Han period. There was a follow up question from my household. A friend is visiting. Um, and um, the question was this Would it be possible? in your view, to begin to write an environmental history of the early empires? What do they mean by environmental history? I think what they mean is Mark Elvin's book um, called Retreat of the Elephants that focuses uh -huh. on environmental questions. Yeah. Um, I don't see why it should be impossible, but it might involve an enormous amount studying Chinese, Japanese scholars, Russians perhaps as well. Um, it would be extremely difficult to limit such a study, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you do that? Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we have a follow-up from Andrew Hardy, who is asking, how did you decide to work on Han at a time when there really wasn't a field of Han studies yet? <laughs> what the devil does he mean there wasn't a field of Han studies? Has the fellow never read a book in Japanese, for God's sake? <laughs> no, he's well-read. Read? He's well-read. Um, and he knows he worked with Hosove. I think he's thinking that when I came to America, there wasn't a place for me to go study Han history. Uh -huh. it's, I think so. oh, in, any more than there was here in, in England. In, right. in Europe, if you wanted to study Han history, you would go to Hosove, would you not? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, maybe Sweden, Karlgren produced uh, De Crepigny, um, Bielenstein, uh, sorry, I think Bielenstein and then De Crepigny was a Bielenstein student, but I may have that wrong. Um, um, not many places, Paris, perhaps. 
everything was jolly, jolly limited. Um, all right, why did I go into Han history? I was a civil servant working in the West Country with no access to a Chinese library to school oriental studies, except if I took a day's leave, took a train and did it that way. Well, what were people working on then? There had not been the specialization that we have nowadays, anything but. The books that one had about the history of China, slim little volumes probably, and pretty badly written, and with general statements. Sometimes they were written by Chinese with, oh, great pride in China, and never thought of asking a question. Um, I'm talking about the 1950s. Change came here in this country in those years at the School of Oriental and African Studies, thanks largely to Professor Pulley Blank, who put some real historical thinking and some scholarly work into the history of the Tang Empire. And that was a great start. Similar changes were being advanced in the United States of America, but it was still very early, change, very early times. No Cambridge history of China, for heaven's sake. My God, could anybody have thought of writing that in those days? No, people simply didn't have the information, the knowledge, with which to do so. You can see a change coming about. By about 1970, it was rather different. And that was when those volumes of the Cambridge history were being thought of and perhaps planned. Um, it has been a steady increase in the extent of knowledge, which has made it possible to look at questions of wider impact and deeper influence. And I think this can be applied to the history of China, certainly prehistory, thanks to the great archeological work. Um, it can certainly be implied to the early dynasties certainly to Tang and Sung and their successors. All of which means that there's a the hell of a lot of work to do. Well, um, I just on this note want to say that it is you who steered me to the marvelous work of Lu Simian, the Qin Hanshur, and um, uh, his writings have proven to be an endless font of information um, um, for which I'm very, very grateful. Um, very good. Thanks. You've mentioned uh, Husselve several times now and the, the way that kind of his work and, and then later your work has changed the way we think about Han Law. Um, Daniel Friedman, who's a graduate student here, sends a question, what misconceptions about early imperial law remain uh, today that you feel uh, need to be redressed? You're asking a technical question, which I, I don't think I could answer that one out, out of the back of my head. It's, uh, you know, I don't know the detail. So let me phrase it a bit differently. Not quite yeah, the same yeah. question. Uh -huh. You studied all those years with Hosove, and often you were studying Han law and later Qin law. What do you think you learned the most from your studies with Hosove? 
how to read a text accurately, how to handle the work of editors, and how to relate <clears throat> the contents of what we were reading to other developments in China's history. Now, on that last point, I think we were a bit short. Remember, we were working on this, what, in the 1960s, 70s, and of course, we didn't know anything like as much about the government of Han China then as we know now. But uh, we were driving to get there, put it that way. Mm. And of course, the main thing to me about Tone Hulsi Bay, well, there's a main thing, one thing was <laughs> his open mindedness his continual willingness to compare and contrast things we were reading about and studying with what was happening elsewhere in the world, either at the time or at a comparable period. Could I follow up? Uh, there, there's there's um, a student uh, named Sidney Tang who asks what element of Han society is most relevant? And I want to, um, kind of rephrase that following what you just said about Husselwey's teaching. Um, when you listen to news broadcasts, what most recently, what was the story or what was the, 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 the element of, of kind of Han history that that seem most relevant to things that are happening. And I don't mean necessarily invasions of other countries or uh, being caught having parties during epidemics. Um, but I, I do mean, I, I think I, I had several questions from students saying, you know, when you try to connect the past up to the present, what are some of the things during the Han that you feel do give you a kind of perspective on what's going on today? Well, I think the whole creation and extension of a major rule over a large territory, the evolution of institutions and officials which are capable of controlling the place and running the institutions, the failures, the type of failures which are witnessed by those who held official offices, the degree to which, dare I say, principles would be, you see, I'm see, the way in which principles would be advanced, changed, and the way in which recent developments would be judged against existing principles. See what I'm trying to get at. Exactly. I think, I think in essence, you're saying the human condition hasn't changed much, <laughs> uh, despite technological advances. What am I to answer to that? <laughs> well, what I mean by that is we can read a biography and understand the emotions that yes. the biographical subjects are experiencing. Um, and that's because we have those emotions too. So I always think looking at the distant past is a safe way to contemplate um, two things. Are we living in the best of all possible worlds? Could these <laughs> worlds be better? Um, if we borrowed aspects from the past. And also, what can we learn about human beings and the way they typically operate? Yeah. I yeah. think so. And, and are, there, are there time-tested ways to deal with these constants of human nature that have evolved and, and you know, that we can, we can borrow from the past? Right? Constance of human nature, your phrase, mm. I see what you mean, oh. <laughs> and I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
maybe not constants of um, all of the human condition, but uh -huh. people are recognizable as people with our sets of dilemmas and emotions. Yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> So uh, we, we only have time for a few more questions, I believe. There's one that's come from Steve Roddy, mm -hmm. who asks, speaking of relevance to the present, what do you think of the recent discovery of Han era bamboo slips with some Chinese characters in the Caucasus region? Should we be looking harder for more evidence of early connections across the arc of Central Asia that may have followed in the wake of people like Zhang Qian? I hate to have to say it. Thanks perhaps to physical reasons, I hadn't heard of the discovery of these strips. So I can't answer your question. Sorry. So I think the real question is, and I think I know what you'll say, but I'm give, you'll give the answer. Um, of course, we should be looking outside the present day borders of the PRC. We, we made very sure we did that in China's early empires. Yeah. Um, we looked into Korea, in North Vietnam, into Central Asia. Um, I don't think either of us commands Russian, um, but um, you know, we have students who do. <laughs> I've been fascinated and never taken it properly. The whole question of Chinese advance into Central Asia. I can think of it in so many different ways, politically, commercially, linguistically, and, and culturally. But there, I need another lifetime to do that. <laughs> Um, I think they've called up Steve Roddy here. Steve, do you do you want to add anything? Uh, uh, no, no, just thank you so much for uh, all of these answers. And I'm I'm fascinated by this question. It, it came up actually in a conference at Berkeley a few years ago when uh, someone from Shanghai uh, gave us uh, some an early view of these uh, of this evidence from the Caucasus that had just been discovered. Uh, so I'm I'm really interested myself in uh, the question of you know how early these sorts of things made their way westward and of course now with China's interest in the whole region I think uh, uh, you know it's it behooves us all to to look closely uh -huh. what's happening there. Thank you. Really good. We have less than a minute. Um, and so I think what we might do is spend 30 seconds of that minute um, thanking Michael on behalf of all of the attendees um, and um, saying that we'll try to make sure that questions that have been logged in, um, I will get to with Michael in mid-May. Um, and um, uh, we want to thank everybody who participated. We know many people will be participating in China and uh, tomorrow morning <laughs> on YouTube. Um, and we'll take their questions as well, um, either Mark or um, me. Um, um, yes, we... Uh, We'll take um, those questions. Thanks so much to the Center for Chinese Studies. Um, and thank you, everyone. But most of all, Michael, thank you. <laughs> most no, of all. let me thank all of you for this very interesting conversation. My God, you've made me think. Okay. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> More to do. I remember Michael saying to me, and this is the last, when I was a student in Cambridge, um, taking the tripos with him, um, there's so much to do. Um, yeah. and I, I think um, that's why I probably ended up going in Han history, the sense there's so much more to do. Thank you. 
Um, and meanwhile, in the chat, we're getting all kinds of people saying, thank you, thank you. Um, so thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing this time with us. Well, it's been a pleasure. Good. I told you it would be fun. Yes. <laughs> <So>. Yes. <laughs> and it was. Thanks.